We're blessed to have with us today Brother Wayne Huntley. He needs no introduction. He has preached at a majority of because of the times, and we'll always have him preaching here. He is such a great revivalist, terrific man of God, has built an outstanding church, and on top of all of that, a great preacher, and then a tremendous Christian. We're glad to have he and his sweet wife, uh, a part of Because of the Times, are always so willing to come help us project the vision for men and women hungry for revival. Would you welcome Brother Wayne Huntley from Raleigh. And praise the Lord, everybody. There is a tremendous spirit of encouragement in this sanctuary today. Turn around to somebody and say, be encouraged. Now be encouraged. The Holy Ghost wants to enlist every able-bodied believer in this auditorium in the great campaign of worldwide evangelism. That's what the Spirit is doing. Moving through this house. Recruiting, renewing, refreshing, and revitalizing the last day soldiers of Calvary that will shake this world one more time before the rapture takes place. Be encouraged. I didn't feel I'd have much left when Brother Pugh finished. My words will be redundant. I will assume that as a confirmation. You will hear some redundant terms. Trust me, I had them down before he preached. And so I must assume that this is what the Spirit is saying right now. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse number 35. These meetings have been such a tremendous inflow of inspiration and motivation and challenge. I appreciate a challenge. To do more, to be better, and to be bigger for God. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse number 35. 1 Samuel 20, 35. And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David. Needless to say, this is a significant moment of divine appointment. If God is going to speak to His church, I believe He does it ever so clearly, ever so strongly, at because of the times. Not only is it because of the location of this meeting, which provides a powerful apostolic platform for which this takes place, but also there gathers here perhaps many of the hungriest people in Pentecost. This audience is electrified with desire. It is ignited with holy hunger for the things of the Spirit. And with that in mind, there is absolutely no telling what the Lord will do. I continue reading now with verse number 36 out of 1 Samuel 20. And he said unto his lad, Run, Find out now the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. Would you say beyond him? And when the lad was come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? Would you say beyond thee? It was beyond him. It was beyond thee. And Jonathan cried after the lad, Make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. 
But the lad knew not anything. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. Not everybody is going to know what's going on. They have no revelation of the matter. This that we're dealing in is not publicized on the billboards of America. But it's in that secret place in the Spirit that we hear what can't be heard. And we see what can't be seen. And we're going to tap into that and we already are today. I draw the message from the words that I had you emphasize. Beyond Him and beyond Thee. The thought. The margin of the miraculous. The margin of the miraculous. Turn around to somebody one more time and say, Be encouraged, it's going to happen. I'm going to kick up a little higher gear. Will you go with me? I don't think you're surprised. Clap your hands to the Lord and let's have a little more preaching here for a few minutes and then we'll go. Hallelujah! Blessed be the name of the Lord. You may be seated. With the fact that this is in its origination dedicated to a young minister's conference, I feel comfortable to preach to the young ministers. With young ministers and youthful pastors in mind and on my heart, I'd like to dedicate the next few thoughts to these things. A healing of the paralysis of analysis. Secondly, a deliverance from the woeful ditch and dungeon of indecision. And thirdly, an assault and an assassination on intimidation, frustration, and inferiority complexes. Above the pulpit performance, the religious entertainment, the social fellowship, or even the pursuit of power, the overwhelming majority are gathered at because of the times 1998 in desperate desires to hear from God. We need direction. We need direction. Would somebody stand up and shout, I came looking for direction. That's the voice of the Spirit. You're going to know where to go from here. You're going to know what to do from here. You're going to find your direction. You may be seated. The secret signals between Jonathan and David were destiny determinants. They were indicators to go or to come. To run or to return. They would indicate the favor or the fury of the Father. When Jonathan screamed, Is not the arrow beyond thee? To the lad, it was just a statement that his master needed a little more practice in his archery skills. But it was more than merely an errant arrow. While some might think the target was missed, in reality, the message was a bullseye. Because somewhere out of sight was the anointed shepherd boy with his ear attuned, waiting on a voice that would tell him where to go from here. I believe anointed young ministers have come and above the hustle and the bustle, they've got their ears cupped. And a lot of folks may not hear it. But they're going to get a message that's going to tell them whether to return or to run. Proper perception and direction is greater than power. I want to say that again. Proper perception, and that's what we've been hearing preached. Perception 
and direction is greater than power. What is it that separates ministries? What is it that separates churches? What is it that puts some in a lofty place, striving just to survive, while others are thriving? The Bible gives us a mystical scripture that has all often intrigued me. In Matthew 13 and 12, Jesus said, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. This is a very challenging verse of Scripture because the Bible lets us know there is something that you can have. That if you have that, it brings more. God is not socialistic. He doesn't take from the rich and give to the poor. He gives more to the rich while the poor get poorer. In the things of the Spirit. Churches that are blessed continue to be blessed. Churches that are growing continue to grow. The big churches get bigger. Where there's revival, it gets larger. I came to the cause of the times desiring to find out what is it that I can get a hold of that if I've got it, I will have more. It's not nearly as profound as it said, as I have stated, or you know I would not be preaching it. But I want you to hear it. I think I found out what it is. Whosoever hath to him shall be given. He shall have more abundance. Whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. And then the Bible said in verse number 19 of that same chapter of Matthew 13, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and here it is, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. The thing that continues the blessing of God is understanding. You can hear the word, but if you don't understand, the wicked one can come and snatch what you've got. What we've come to the cause of the times is, is this. God, give us understanding. Help us to understand what's going on. Let me hasten. Hey, this Bible is so marvelous. Brother Pugh read this verse. All my life I have heard that Solomon prayed for wisdom. Now wait. Trap. That Solomon prayed for wisdom. He was the wisest man that ever lived. But I read the scriptures afresh. And my brothers and sisters, he did not ask for wisdom. He did not pray for wisdom. He said, give thy servant an understanding heart. And God said, because you've asked for that, I'm not only going to give you that, because whoever has it, it's going to get more. I'm not just going to give you understanding. I'm going to give you riches, and I'm going to give you honor, because you got understanding. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So our preaching is to try to shed some understanding. If you, young minister, if you, youthful pastor, can just get some understanding, the arrow is beyond thee. In every instance, the arrow is beyond thee. I ask you this afternoon, 
Is it not true that life's greatest goals, fondest dreams, and loftiest aspirations are at best just beyond our fingertips? I want to tell you that's the same if you are a home missionary or if you are Brother James Kilgore. They are building a building right now. But what they want, they don't have the means to do. And I haven't checked with his secretary. But I know the Bible principle. The arrow is always beyond thee. If you're a home missionary, it's beyond you. If you're James Kilgore, it's beyond you. We're constantly calculating, accumulating, garnering, gathering, accruing, and assembling, putting it all together only to find out the arrow is beyond us. We never have enough to get the job done. Turn around and somebody say, you'll never have enough. Please understand that. If you'll understand that, you won't be intimidated. If you'll understand that, you won't be frustrated. If you'll understand that, you won't be distressed. If you'll understand that, you won't be discontented. If you'll understand that, you won't be in despair. It's always beyond me. And with that in mind, I want to tell you, you aren't weird. I said you aren't weird. You're not a misfit. You're not a less ingenious, gifted, or talented person. It is all by divine design. It's the margin of the miraculous. For the Bible says you can plant and you can water but God gives the increase. If it grows, it is God. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Learn all the growth principles you can learn. Learn all the people skills you can learn. Learn all the procedures and techniques you can learn. But above and beyond of that, no. I've got to have a move of God. I've got to have a move of God. For upon this rock, I will build my church learn it right now settle it right now you cannot build a church upon this rock Jesus said ah he's the only one that can build the church You may be seated. The distinguishing factor between the true and the false sometimes is hard to discern. Because both bullocks look the same. Sometimes the discernment of the true and the false for a while it's difficult to know because the dissection of the sacrifice was the same. The wood was the same. But the prophet of God took a direct advantage when he set up the parliamentary procedure and the rules of debate. Because he said, let the God I 
I will debate you, but this is going to be the test. Let the God that answers by fire, let Him be God. Because the prophet of God knew our God is a consuming fire. And two times the prophet said in 2 Kings 18, put no fire under. Put no fire under. Somebody sung a song years ago and said, God's got a fire. I heard an echo. Who said that? God's got a fire. He don't need no matches. We haven't come to because of the time looking for matches. Because God's got a fire. And he don't need no matches. God said, you may be seated, stack the wood, kill the sacrifice, build the altar, and then get back. Because after you've done what you can, do what you cannot do. I'll send the fire. A lot of folks want to know what makes us different from the other tongue-talking sects of our generation. I see three things in this text that separate us. Number one is rare commitment. Because the prophet of God poured out barrels of water in a time of drought. I know everybody around there was licking their mouths and my God, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? We're in a drought. But God honors rare sacrifice. It's when you need that last ten bucks, but you put it in the offering. It's when you're too tired to lift your hands, but somehow you get them up there anyway. It's that rare sacrifice. You may be seated. I want to tell you tonight, don't you think for 30 seconds, don't you be intimidated for 30 seconds, there is no other tongue-talking movement on this planet that can match this movement in sacrifice and commitment. That's why the fire falls. That's why the fire falls. Where there is no sacrifice, there is no fire. You may be seated. Let me hurry. The second differentiation was the water. We are different in the water. The prophet said, Baptize my sacrifice. Baptize my sacrifice. The thing that makes us different is what we do in the water. We call that name. We baptize in that name. You may be seated. And of course the third thing is the fire falls. The fire falls. Falls. Let me tell you how our churches are growing and what's bringing people to our church. The things that a lot of Pentecostals are ashamed of. The kids are going to school and testifying about. They're going to school now and say, have you ever seen anybody run in church? Have you ever seen anybody fall out in the floor? Have you ever heard anybody talk into, you need to come to our church. Where 
where the fire is. Where the fire is. God said, do what you can. And I'll do what you can't. You may be seated. The Bible says, we have all sinned. Come short. We, we've been cut down. We're short. We just can't reach it. We've come short of the glory. The Antichrist's greatest effort will only count for six, six, six. Six is man's number. Seven, God's number. And the Antichrist wants to be God. And so he says six, but he's not there yet. He says six, and he's not there yet. And he says six, and he can't get there. And he never will get there. Do all you know to do. Do all you can do. And there will still be a gap. Would you stand and stretch your hand toward me? That's God. That's your goal. That's your dream. That's your aspiration. You can lean and cry and groan and moan and reach and press, but it's God's will that you can't get there by yourself. The Holy Ghost has got to be a bridge between you and your goal. Between you and your dream. Let me see I'll preach this a few more minutes. You see? Thank you, you're mighty kind. You'll, you'll see it in the plan of salvation. There's a margin of the miraculous. God says, in order for salvation to come, a sinner's got his part. Preacher's got his part. And God's got his part. The sinner repents. That's his part. The preacher baptizes. That's his part. And then God pours out the Holy Ghost. That's his part. You can bring people to church, but you can't put them in the church. You can gather a crowd, but only God builds a church. You can show people truth, but God causes them to see it. You can anoint and pray, but God heals the sick. You may be seated. The Bible gives us a powerful story, the first miracle, physical miracle after the birth of the New Testament church. The Bible said there was a lame man that was carried daily to the gate of the temple. And the gate was called beautiful. If the gate's beautiful, what's the temple like? The miracle of that story was not the name of Jesus in this instance. It was not even the names of Peter and John in this instance. But the scripture says 
there was a group of people there that are only identified in this way. They. There was a group of people there called they. And they carried him daily to the gate. They did it. And I, I love they. I love they. Because it was they. You know, I kind of reflected on they and I thought. We sing it and say it a lot on Sunday mornings to wake our sleepy congregations up. It's one of our favorite alarm clocks in Pentecost. To get the mattress off people's faces and the cracklings out of their eyes. Pastor will step to the pulpit service leader and he'll say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. What he's really saying is, hello. Good morning. Wake up. I don't know who they were, but David was visited by they. David said somebody came by where I was. And they said, these missionaries are they. They're going to the country. They're going to the city. And they're saying, let us go unto the house of the Lord. And if you think David was shouting then, look at this. He said, I was glad when they said it. If he was glad when he started, what do you think he did when he got there? I don't know who they were, but the Bible said the man was above 40 years and he was laid daily at the gate. I have to believe that there were people whose daily responsibility... I don't see any children. I don't see anybody small enough for me to carry. Okay. Daily. To go to church meant they had to go by and pick up Brother Mangan. Daily they did that for 40 years. And there's two things I want to quickly mention now going that really makes them heroes to me. Number one, they did it although they knew his motives were wrong. He was not even thinking about getting into the temple. He was just wanting a good seat to beg money. My brother and my sister, you have no right to judge a man's motive for wanting to come to church. I'm not going to go get them. They're just looking for a handout. I'm not going to go get them. He's just looking for a boyfriend. He's just looking for... What happened to the old saying that we don't care how they come? It's how they leave. The second point I want to show you is for 40 years they carried him and they took him to the very gate. You know why? Cripples could not go in the temple. And although it was impossible for him to get in, they said, that's not our problem. Our problem is to make sure we get him as close as we can. So go ahead and have your bus ministry contest. Go ahead and give the kids a hot dog. Go ahead and have pizza parties. But do your best to get them right near the gate. And after you've done all you can do, the miracle's going to come by. And he's going to walk in the temple. Everybody shout, when you do all you can, and it's not enough, then God will do what you can't do, and it'll be more than enough. But hear this, 
He will not do his part until you do your part. And he will not do your part. He said, Peter, wake up. Acts 12. The angel appeared. Wake up. What about the chains? Don't worry about the chains. I'll take care of them. What about the doors? Don't worry about the doors. I'll take care of them. What about the soldiers? Don't worry about the soldiers. I'll take care of them. But put your shoes on. Put your clothes on. I'll get you out of here, but I'm not going to dress you. There is something you can do. And if you'll do what you can do, I'll do what you cannot do. You got one revival? Preach it. You got one sermon? Preach it. You got half of what you need in the bank? Go as far as half will take you. He can make up the difference. Don't wait till you think you got it all. You'll never have it all. He won't let you have it all. the word of the Lord to somebody. Quit sitting there waiting on a perfect day. Quit sitting on a day you got everything you need. Just go on with what you've got. And the Bible says, as they went, as they went, they were healed. Remain standing just a minute. I don't mean to be dramatical or sensational or to try to add support to what I'm saying. But I want to tell you, when I listened to Brother Pugh and I told my wife, I don't have nothing. He just preached it all. I was wondering if anybody had a dictionary. But as I listened, and I heard Brother Anthony Mangan say in his home on Monday night, and I heard him say it last night, God reacts when we act. Yeah. Then I knew the Holy Ghost is telling somebody, you'll never have it all. You just got to go and obey and believe. And he will make up the difference. Go ahead, Noah. Build the ark. I'll fill it and I'll float it. Go ahead, Joshua and Israel. March around the walls. I'll pull them down. Go ahead, Gideon. Break the pitchers. Shout. I'll take care of the Midianites. Go ahead, servants. Fill up the water pots. And on the way back, it's not going to be water anymore. It started out common. It started out ordinary. But it turned into a miracle. Somewhere, it's going to turn into a miracle. When I was a senior in high school, I felt my call to preach. Two sons in the family. I was the oldest. Father that wasn't at home and a mother that leaned on me strongly. Appreciated 
what God was doing in my life, but was crying over it. Who the last few weeks of my senior year, every morning when she served me my breakfast, she served it with tears. She wanted me to obey God. She wanted me to be used of God. But she just had that fleshly bond. And so in my senior year of high school, I went to high school and I worked two jobs. Because my mother said, for you to go to Bible college, that's what I wanted to do. She said, you'll have to raise $500. Now that was a while back. And that was like $5,000. And I was working in a grocery store bagging groceries and stocking shelves and, and then helping a florist man deliver flowers. That was almost impossible. Clock was running out. Time was almost gone. I'd done everything I could do and I didn't have but $250. I was driving this old ragged car that I had. That was all I had. And a man ran a red light in a pickup truck. And hit my car. And to beat all, when he got out, he was about as big as Brother Jim Larson, and he had a police uniform on. And I was a lot smaller. I said, Oh my God, what am I going to do? He come running to my car. Are you all right? Yes, sir, I'm fine. You okay? Yes, sir, I'm fine. He said, Listen, I, I, I don't want this to go to my insurance or. Count against me on my job. He said, would you just go get an estimate of what it would take to fix your car and, and, and I'll pay you the highest bid. I said, yes, sir, I'll do that. I got his name and address. One of the men in the, car, in the church beat the dents out of my old car and smoothed it all out. And I got an a, 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 a estimate to take to him that was 200 and fifty dollars. And I had my five hundred dollars. When you do all you can do, then he is going to do what you can't do. Lift your hands and praise him right now. He's doing it right now. 